everyone. My name is Jeannie Rizzo, and I have the privilege of being the CEO and president of the Breast Cancer Fund. The mission of the Breast Cancer Fund is to focus on identifying environmental causes of breast cancer and advocating to eliminate them. I'm here today to talk about plastics and breast cancer, but what I'm really here to talk about is a vision of the world in which women do not live in fear of losing their breasts or their lives to breast cancer because of what we, the decisions that we make today and tomorrow. Yesterday's decisions have already taken their toll. Well over 200,000 women, and increasingly men, will be diagnosed with invasive breast cancer this year. Over 50,000 women will face treatment decisions about ductal carcinoma in situ, and over 40,000 women will die this year alone. This reflects back to us the failure of our industrialized society to take care of the most vulnerable amongst us. When I was growing up, an immediate post-World War II baby, my second-generation Italian-American family was abandoning the ways of the past. They were leaving the old country behind. With heavy accents, the women in my big family hosted Tupperware parties. I don't know if any of you remember those, but I'm going to point this somewhere. Okay. Selling everything from burpable containers to rolling pins to replace the great wooden rolling pin that my grandma used to have. The great thing about this thing is that it has a screw cap on the end of it. So you could put ice water in so you could roll your dough more effectively, but you could also carry your lemonade to the clam bakes and to the barbecues. And we did. And I still have that rolling pin. That is my rolling pin. I don't know what to do with it. I'm afraid to get rid of it. So we'll get rid of it now for a little while. The factory that my mother worked in during the war was a piecemeal operation that made bullets. That plant was then converted after the war to a plastics plant. My dad came home and he went to work there. And he brought home all the seconds and all the odd, odds and ends, things that we couldn't even figure out what to use, but we had plastic. We had plenty of plastic at home. At the same time, in our neighborhood, in our Italian neighborhood, there was a truck that came by two, three times a week. It was the vegetable man. And he would come by with this open truck with incredible fruits and vegetables. And he would signal his arrival with a bell and a yell. Vegetables, he would say. And we would run out with the flour sacks. And my mother would say, get whatever looks good. But get a, couple of, get a couple of things that he's got for cheap, because even though they're a, little, they're a little bruised, they'll be OK, and I can put them up. And by put them up, she meant that she could put them up in jars for the winter. Well, at some point, the vegetable man stopped coming around. My mom stopped putting up tomatoes in jars and began buying canned foods. We had a second generation of children in my family, and they had plastic bottles, pl plastic baby bottles. Potluck stopped and we were, you know, started actually, and we started carrying our, our food back and forth in and out to each other's homes in those great Tupperware party pie plates and things with carryalls. But most importantly, my mom learned on her black and white TV that we could have better living through chemistry, and she taught us all really well. So my generation grew up knowing that plastic was a symbol of modern life but it was the most American way to live. Were there any consequences to this convenience? Back then, I don't know if there was anybody asking that hard question. Not scientists, not industry, not government. We weren't asking the right questions. We weren't investigating the downsides, considering the impact on health and the environment. Time passed, and we still didn't know, or maybe we didn't want to know, that we were creating the building blocks of cancer. It has taken a generation for those hard questions to force their way up into our consciousness and gratefully to be in this room. What is the price of plastic? Two decades ago, women started asking tough questions about breast cancer. Women were sitting around kitchen tables in Long Island with maps of their communities and push pins, and they were putting a pin for every place where they knew someone had breast cancer. Similarly, there were women up in Cape Cod, and they were standing over the cranberry bogs wondering, is it the pesticides? There were women in the San Francisco Bay Area asking, was it air pollution? 
because so many of them and their friends were being diagnosed with breast cancer. They knew something was terribly wrong, and they knew then that awareness was not enough. A decade or so later, some of those same women began asking, why are our daughters and our granddaughters breast budding before they even enter middle school? What was going on? My journey to understanding that there is a connection between toxic chemicals and breast cancer, between the toxic chemicals in plastic and breast cancer, began with the death of one of those pioneering women from whom I learned so much and for whom I dedicate my work every day. I bring her into the room, and I ask you all in your hearts to bring into the room somebody you know, somebody you've lost from breast cancer. Dedicate the rest of our time together to that person. So I'm driven by a deep sense of inquiry about why there has been such a dramatic increase in the incidence of breast cancer since the introduction of over 80,000 synthetic chemicals, basically unregulated in this country, since my dad got home from that World War II. I know that I am at much greater risk than my mother was. As a mother and grandmother, I know that my two granddaughters are destined to an even more dramatic risk of early onset puberty and potentially of later life breast cancer. As a nurse, I'm obliged to ask the public health question, what are we doing about prevention? As an environmental health advocate, I need to look upstream. I need to find the causes of breast cancer, we all do, and we need to push the mainstream to pay attention. We know that a woman's lifetime risk of breast cancer is connected directly to her exposure to, breast, to estrogen. The host of chemicals that go into making plastics, whether it's polystyrene, polyvinyl chloride, phthalates, bisphenol A, are all in one way or the other, acting as carcinogens or disruptors of our endocrine system. We know that many of these chemicals act like estrogen and other hormones in our body, and it's this twisted mimicking of hormones that creates just the right, and indeed the wrong conditions, to provoke puberty and for breast cancer to thrive. There are literally hundreds of studies that affirm this. I don't know that we need science in this room to tell us that girls are going into puberty earlier or that there is breast cancer in epidemic proportions that one in eight women in her lifetime will be diagnosed with breast cancer. So back to these chemicals in plastic and how they act in strange ways. They act at very low doses to cross the placenta and impact the developing fetus. Others will affect the mammary gland at very vulnerable times, windows of susceptibility and development, like that critical neonatal period, that baby period, the extended time of puberty, and I say that because we are extending puberty from very early breast budding through to girl's menstruation and also during pregnancy. Some of these chemicals accumulate in our bodies and they cause continued harm because we've, we're holding on to them. And then there are many others that we're exposed to every day, so we're result, resulting in a sustained, continuous exposure. And I think we've all heard there are multiple chemicals in plastic. We're not just exposed to one at a time. They interact with each other, they interact with our genetic makeup, and they even interact with the medications that we take. It's frankly a toxic load that we cannot sustain and we are not sustaining. And yet, we still seem to be more in love with plastic than we are with the truth. I want to focus just a minute on that chemical bisphenol A, BPA. You've heard about it in baby bottles, sports bottles, water bottles, sippy cups, food containers. And I want to draw particular attention to the fact that it is in the epoxy lining of food cans. That is an incredible, incredible realization for us that in our effort to make food safe, we have lined it with this toxic chemical, including infant formula. And bisphenol A is one of those oddball chemicals that causes greater harm at low doses, much lower than the allowable level under our regulatory system. BPA is also a very unstable polymer. It seeks fat easily. So it, wants, it breaks itself down, it can't hold itself together, and then it gets into any um, fat 
type food. So think about your coconut milk, your high fat coconut milk, your, I don't know, nobody here is maybe having Campbell's chunky food, but it would be like that. It, it leaches into food. It has been shown to both cause mammary tumors and into, to interfere with the chemotherapy of women who have breast cancer. So why in the world is this chemical in food containers? We know that 93% of Americans are carrying bisphenol A in our bodies. Why would we agree to keep hauling this chemical around, replenishing it every day as it interferes with our basic biological systems, wreaks havoc on our hormone systems, our reproductive organs, and is linked to breast cancer? Think of it this way. Our bodies are being continuously polluted with toxic chemicals and plastics. We're storing them. We're recycling them, we're reusing them ourselves, and we're not refusing them. And if you consider that a woman's body is the first environment for her baby, you can clearly see the parallels between our concern for the mountains of plastic that are in our oceans and the similar trespass of plastics into our bodies. The link between what we can all only imagine in our faraway oceans, for those of us who haven't traveled there, and what we feel right here is absolutely clear. But believe it or not, I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist about breast cancer. And why? Because less than 10% is strictly genetic. This is a very complex disease, but there are many points of intervention. There are ways that we can reduce environmental exposures and remove entire classes or categories of toxins from the human body and reduce a woman's risk. So if we go back to our vision of a world where we take care of health in advance rather than after the fact, we can shift the paradigm. That paradigm of better living through chemistry, better chemistry for living, better oceans for living, better food for living. We can imagine a world where we use precaution to ground our decision making so that we're not surprised by the products and processes and unintended impacts on human health and the environment of the decisions that we make. We can take advantage of the advances in green chemistry. This is a revolutionary philosophy that unites government, academic, and industrial communities to create environmentally benign alternatives to our current materials and technologies. And we can look to nature to help us design solutions to the technological problems that we're facing in that innovative concept called biomimicry. We can take all that we've learned over the last 50 or 60 years and invest in it and invest in innovation. I think most importantly, we need to harness the energy that emerges from our collective knowing our collective realization that protecting our daughters and our granddaughters and future genera generations of women from breast cancer and saving our environment are inextricably linked and they're much more important than all the plastic bottles in the world. We have a very big mountain to climb to protect our health and the health of our environment. Every year, a group of breast cancer survivors goes up this mountain carrying the message that we have to do something to prevent breast cancer. So let's get on the same rope team. Let's guide each other to a common goal. Let's respect the journey that we are on together. Let's keep our eye on the summit. Thank you very much. <laughs>